Alright, this is Mr. Palmer here with another video on computer science. Uh, before we continue this video, make sure you go over your notes on procedural pr uh, languages, um, declarative languages as well, and uh, programming paradigms. <coughs> so, uh, final video of the programming paradigm series, uh, looking at OOP, that's Object Orientated Programming. Uh, big questions for this video are what are what is OOP to begin with, and then looking at um, UML2. Um, can you uh, first of all you need to be able to interpret class object use case state sequence activity and communication diagrams a lot of them and you need to be able to draw for the OCR current OCR spec in uh, 2015 uh, can you draw class object use case and communication diagrams okay so um, looking back at procedural programs there were a couple of big errors that were picked up from that okay first of all there's little data security you've got a big uh, procedural program you might not be using local variables uh, global variables and you might be have your data structures in different places but um, it, you know your uh, is is very easy for parts of your program to look at the data in other parts of the program okay uh, also it's hard to reuse code so uh, while these people were um, creating the procedural programs, they started to notice things. For example, we got whales, we got lizards, we got tigers, and we have a, a procedural program that is dealing with um, these different creatures. And they started to realize that you know all animals have something in common, and they started to come up with this idea that um, actually uh, we can see what data is common between things, and that's where object-oriented programming comes in because that basically says that. Um, everything essentially is a data structure, okay? Um, those data structures model the real world, and then we can create objects out of those templates of data structures. And the program is made up of objects that interact with one another. So, in uh, a procedural program, you would have modules. In o OOP, you have classes. You have subroutines in procedural programs, and these are replaced with methods. And the methods allow your different objects to um, interact with each other and access their data. So this for example would be an animal class in my uh, program. Uh, I have my class name at the top. Okay, so this is a class diagram. These are the attributes. So this would be like the the data that's within it. Uh, some of that data might be um, public. Some of it might be protected. So it's private and can only be seen and dealt with within that class. Okay, and then I have different methods that allow, um, you know, my object to function, and things like set weight and get weight would be methods that can be called by other objects and allow them and allow them to interact with my um, particular animal object that I've created. There's also something that here then that I'm talking about called encapsulation, which is basically that the attributes within an object that is created are hidden, right? They are within that object, and we don't really know about the data that's within an object and how the processing is taking place inside it. All we're interested in is that we can call the get weight and it will give us a weight back, or we can send it some data w with the set weight, and it will, when we pass that data to it, and it will pa use that data that we pass to it to set its weight. All right. So encapsulation is about in is creating, you know, capsule. If you think about what the, the meaning of the word capsule and encapsulation is about hiding what's going on inside it to create a, a little protect a little object okay so inheritance is when well you think about animals all different animals all different but they fall in categories but they all have certain things in common okay so this is a different type of class diagram where I've got my animal um, class yeah I can have reptiles that are animals and I can have mammals that are animals and there's no point me redefining the way the Latin name the common name the get weight set weight blah 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 for each of those different things so what I can do is so use something called inheritance where my reptile inherits um, the properties and methods of the animal class all right and my mammal does the same thing but what I can do is you can notice in the reptile and the mammal they're different to each other because they uh, have different uh, methods and properties that are specific to the reptile but they inherit all of the common things from their ancestor so the animal is a subclass and then 
mammal or reptile will be called a subclass or a derived class two different names for it okay in Java you'll probably hear me or whoever it is your Java teacher talking about subclasses so uh, objects are things that are created from classes all right um, so in Java um, I would probably do something like this mammal Asian elephant equals new mammal and that will allow me to create an object called Asian elephant in my system which I can then use to um, uh, in my program so if I go back to my uh, idea of encapsulation I have uh, an Asian elephant mammal and I have a Bengal tiger mammal, mammal. now because of encapsulation those properties are the attributes that are within it are hidden so the Bengal tiger might want to eat the Asian elephant but it doesn't know whether it's a good idea or not because it can't see the weight of that uh, mammal the Asian elephant what it can see though is the get weight method so it can do Asian elephant dot get weight and that will return um, you know some kind of number back to it whatever it was 2700 kilos and then hopefully the Bengal tiger will have some processing in it that will make it decide that it's not a good idea to attack the elephant all right this is not a diagram that you need to know this is just uh, just reiterating over the concept of encapsulation this however is a diagram that you need to know this is called a use case diagram a use case diagram is a very high level um, diagram that shows how a system can function it has two actors it may have one actor depends on how many uh, actors are using the system and what it does is it shows how the actor uses a particular system so in this case I have customers and waiters where customers and waiters are involved in an order system where the waiter is serving a customer so we know that we're going to allocate waiters to particular customers what we need to think about though is that a use case exists within the uh, a larger use case for example this order thing would exist within uh, for example uh, a booking system which might be part of a larger system within um, a company all right this is a communication diagram right what communication diagrams show are the uh, communication between objects which are instantiated in a system so instantiation is the act of creating instances so when you create an object out of a class all right so uh, here you can see though I'm not using actual object names if I if you remember with um, the Bengal Tigers and the elephant it actually had Bengal Tiger mammal uh, elephant mammal here these are called anonymous classes because I'm showing that a, an object would be instantiated from it but I'm not giving it a name right that might happen during the runtime of the system all right because you might have different managers in this case you might have different floor managers etc etc so the uh, in this diagram uh, the arrow show the direction of the information flow so floor manager is going to receive uh, information data from uh, accounts and order classes um, and that is going to return information back to manager the numbers show the uh, order uh, of the messages and the labels you can see are written um, as if they are methods okay and that are accessing in, uh, information that is stored within an object data that is stored within an object so we got I got uh, the first thing that's going to be uh, first message is going to be get run in total uh, which is uh, floor manager is then going to request orders in process and return the so sales total and then they will be there's something going to take place within floor manager that will return that running total back to the manager okay this is a communication diagram next one you need to know about is a state diagram okay a state diagram shows how an object is instantiated so it shows a state that let me start I'm gonna start again <laughs> a state diagram shows how an object that has been instant instantiated changes over time during a system so you basically have an entry point and an exit point they indicate the lifespan or the life cycle of uh, the object okay the uh, shapes what would you call that a rounded rectangle uh, indicates the actual states that the uh, object can be in the arrows indicate the transition between the states and the labels on the arrow are the trigger events that take place in order to initiate a, a change between states 
hopefully you're not doing that in your lessons you're a bit more on point right this is another type of diagram this is called a sequence diagram so a sequence diagram basically shows the interaction between objects in a system once again you can see this has been done with in, um, anonymous classes all right this is um, some kind of computer game here we have uh, players shooting fireballs at enemies okay the dotted line that goes down indicates the lifespan of an uh, object so you can see with the fireball it has a finite lifespan that after the fireball has been shot um, the uh, the, the uh, sorry someone just came in the uh, the fireball um, basically ceases to exist okay the uh, the arrows indicate um, where a method is called to perform some action so for example the player shoots a fireball uh, the fireball does some stuff with the enemy where it gets the polygon with the polygon is returned there's some processing taking place to determine whether some kind of um, uh, collision has taken place and then the fireball once it dies it, uh, it, uh, it reaches end of lifespan and it, before it's disposed it's returning a message back to player one saying that they're free to fire again all right so we can see that the um, the uh, the fireball has a finite life the rectangles uh, again remember it show that where a method is called in order to um, perform some kind of action this is an activity diagram so this shows the flow of activities that cause state change in an object so the state change showed you um, what was going uh, the different states that an object can be in and the arrows the trigger events that take place an activity diagram shows you uh, where uh, what, what is actually happening within that all right I've forgotten to uh, label this one up with bubbles but uh, you have um, the same uh, start and end uh, dots to show where the beginning and end of the lifespan is okay the diamond shape represents a decision uh, that's pretty much standard as in most things now the black bar represents a fork so within that we have multiple activities taking place in parallel for example if you're checking in to an airport you can go through the um, uh, the security procedure and have your baggage being checked and everything that those things are happening at the same time yeah your baggage is being handled and carried out in another process on one side and you are going through the um, the uh, security check-in procedure sorry down the corridor down the you can drop them here yeah uh, now so the big questions again for this video are that uh, what is object oriented programming can you interpret those class object use case state sequence uh, activity and communication diagrams and can you draw class object use case and communication diagrams what I want you to do is I want you to draw class object use case and communication diagrams for our next lesson um, and these should be within the context of you ordering uh, uh, a pizza from an online booking service for example hungry house right thank you very much um, let's see you uh, soon with those diagrams